Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the class today. It's a little cool here, so I'm just wearing a little, wearing a jacket on. And uh, yeah, let's pray and we will get started. Could one of us please pray with the class and we will start? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this hour that you've given to us to share your word and learn more on it, Father Jehovah. Father, I commit to your our teacher, Father Jehovah, Father Jehovah. Ask you to bless him mighty, Father Jehovah. Bless him indeed, Father Jehovah, in all his work. Father Jehovah, also commit our fellow students, Father Jehovah, that you, Father Jehovah, to learn Father Jehovah, thank you for your honor and glory. I commit to pray for the into your mighty hand of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, man, thank you, Kennedy. All right, good morning, everyone, once again. Um, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, we had to cancel our classes um, last Thursday. Um, all the three lectures, we didn't have them. And um, uh, anyway, we will be able to uh, make sure we complete um, what we want to cover in the course. So, Today, we're going to get into um, our last uh, main topic uh, in this course, um, uh, BC 212 on Christian apologetics, which has to do with uh, social challenges. Uh, how do we as believers respond to social challenges? And uh, uh, the truth is, um, especially when we look at the Western world, uh, social issues are becoming more and more important. Uh, and, and somehow the church is confronted with these issues, as, as we will see. And uh, the fact is, you know, uh, as we look at what's happening in the Western world, uh, sooner or later, similar kinds of things can be expected in other to happen in other parts of the world. So we can actually learn by looking at uh, some of the challenges they are facing. And uh, also, sadly, so the church in the Western world I mean, the, sometimes gets divided. I shouldn't say sometimes, but it is divided even around these social issues. So we have to, you know, that's again a very important lesson for us to learn that uh, uh, while we, you know, the church is faced with these social issues and this will happen you know, in other parts of the world, uh, we must be careful not to let these things divide the church. Sadly, it has happened already in much of the Western world, they are divided based on these social issues. The people, I'm talking about churches, the believers, you know, being on opposite sides and, uh, you know, uh, uh, opposite sides are divided basically around these social issues. So uh, uh, it is important for two reasons, uh, you know, that we discuss these things. It's important, one is because uh, the church will sooner or later have to respond, have to have a voice uh, concerning these matters. And secondly, we have to be careful not to let these matters, these social issues, divide the church. Uh, and then, you know, if the church is divided, it's going to be very weak uh, because people are going to look at the church and say, look, you guys don't even know what to say about this. Uh, you guys are all divided about this. And, and, and then it leaves a, a very weak church. And uh, that's not a good place for the church to be. Right. So uh, we're going to spend some time addressing some of these social issues and, and see if we can, you know, um, have some sort of an understanding on how to give a biblical response to these matters. Um, I'm going to share the uh, PDF that we put out last week. Um, 
yeah, response to social challenges. Now, uh, 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 could somebody read for us First Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen, just to get us uh, started here? First Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. Could somebody? Uh, sorry, verse verse not verse sixteen. We should read verse fifteen. 15, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. So there's a mistake here. This should be verse 15. Could somebody read that for us, please? 1 Timothy 3, 15. Uh, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of truth. Okay, thank you, Samuel. So, um, the Apostle Paul is uh, writing to Timothy, and he says, you know, uh, uh, there's, of course, there's a proper way to conduct yourself in the house of God. And then he tells us something about the house of God, which is the local church, the house of God. The house of God is the pillar and ground of truth. Pillar, as in the upholder, you know, a pillar upholds the building structure. And the ground, meaning the foundation, that means the entire structure st stands on this. So the local church is the pillar and foundation of truth. Where? In the world. So if people want to know what is truth, they should be able to look at what the church stands for. Now, the, they should look at what the church is established on and then understand, you know, this is what truth is. So, in these social challenges or social issues that we are going to, you know, list out some of these, the church should be the upholder of truth in these matters. But like we just said, the church is confronted with, uh, with, with, with pressures from different areas. There is, of course, a spiritual, which is, hey, you've got to stay aligned or stay uh, true to the word of God. And then there is society. Society says, hey, we are changing. We want to be free. We want to, you know, we want to do our own thing. There's the pressure from society. And then there is the legislative side, because uh, in every nation, uh, there are laws being passed about these matters, because these matters have so escalated, they've become so you know, uh, uh, magnified that now the government is passing laws about those matters. Before it was you know, left aside, it, wasn't, it was a non-issue, many of these matters. They were non-issues. They, they just okay it happened. Uh, they were maybe you know uh, rare and few, or maybe it wasn't even considered something to be taken uh, addressed. But today these matters have become so magnified that the church is facing pressure on these matters from a spiritual, social, and legislative side. From all these sides. And uh, the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of truth in the world. So that's a big challenge. The other challenge is, you know, how do we uphold truth and still love, welcome, and relate to people who disagree? You know, so, uh, you know, on these matters, we'll say, look, this is truth. This is what the word of God says. And we as a church are not going to deviate from the word. You know, whatever the government passes as a law, that's up to them. But this is the truth. We're going to stand by it. But then how do we love the people who don't agree with us or who disagree with us? How do you love them? And what if they want to come to church? What if they want to be part of the community? Or or how do we relate to them just even outside the church? So that's another thing to think about and discuss. And another question related to this is, uh, should the church be engaged 
in influencing legislature on this matter? You know, is this a legal, a spiritual battle? Or should the church be engaged practically in terms of legislature? Can spiritual and moral issues be legislated? You know, meaning, uh, example, if somebody is a homosexual, can you put a law that will prevent him from being a homosexual? Or is it more of a spiritual and moral issue? You know, so uh, what is it? And how, how, how are we supposed to address it? Then you have same-sex marriage. I mean, um, can you put a law to say same-sex marriage should not happen? Can it prevent two people uh, of the same sex from living together and doing what they want to do? Uh, you know, or, or is, is the ch should the church focus on the spiritual side of things, which is, hey, reach these people with the love of God and bring the gospel to them and let the gospel touch their lives. You know, so uh, this is, um, these are areas that are really challenging, right? How do we address these things? And then there are practical issues, as we will see. You know, if you're running a business, if you're working in the corporate world, you know, um, and now big things that are happening in the corporate world is, you know, being inclusive. So, you know, they want to include everybody, uh, regardless of your sexual orientation. Uh, but then what do you do? I mean, you're, you're, you have certain beliefs. You know what the Word of God teaches. But now if you are, you know, an HR manager in a corporate setting and your company's policy is to be inclusive and all of that, you know, how do you, you know, have your faith and then still work in an environment like that, you know? So these are all very difficult and practical um, challenges. Uh, I, I'm not saying that, you know, we're going to be able to answer all the questions. But what we want to do is we want to give ourselves a framework which we can use to think through and arrive at answers, biblical answers, in different scenarios. Because there are probably scenarios we haven't yet encountered, which will arise in the coming years uh, in these, these matters, social issues. And so, you know, uh, what it's good for us to have a framework. Okay, this is how we think about it. This is how you approach it. And therefore, this is how you make a decision when it comes to those things. So uh, the goal here in this chapter is hopefully we can develop a framework uh, to address not only the issues mentioned here, but, you know, there will be other things that rise up in days to come. And we should be able to um, think through on those things on those matters. But remember the church is supposed to be the pillar and foundation of truth. We cannot compromise that without compromising the who we are as the church in society. We have to be able to respond to these things. Now, think about this whole area of marriage, homosexuality, same-sex marriage. Now, we know from scripture, and, and I'm not going through the chapters and chapter and verses, um, most of it uh, you're aware of, and you will be looking at it in other courses, that uh, biblically, uh, God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. In the Bible, there's no proof of same-sex marriage. That's, that's, that's against God's design. Similarly, homosexuality itself is sin. You know, mentioned many places in Romans 1, and 1 Corinthians 6, uh, sec, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, yeah. So it is wrong, you know, and Revelation, also in Revelation, uh, um, yeah, what's it? I think it's in Revelation 20, yeah. Uh, the Bible tells us, you know, that uh, these would not inherit uh, the uh, sexually moral. So, Revelation 21 8. So, the, these, these are wrong. Homosexuality is sin, it is wrong, and uh, it's not 
approved by God. And we believe that people can be set free from this kind of lifestyle, right? So Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, when he writes to the Corinthians, you know, he mentions, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, he says, some of you were homosexuals. And I'm reading this here from the uh, New King James, from the homosexuals. But then he says, verse 11, such were some of you, but now you are washed, sanctified, justified. So we know that in the name of Jesus, people who are in that homosexual lifestyle can be brought out, set free, be washed, sanctified, justified. But in society today, if we try to minister to people and try to help them come out of homosexuality, that itself is considered a wrong thing to do. You know, and then in recent times in the news, um, there they've been talking about, you know, especially in the Western world, about Christian camps and so on, which try to our churches and ministries that try to help people come out of this lifestyle and they, they are attacking, saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, leave these people alone. That's the way they're supposed to live. You know, so even the very truth the, that we proclaim and the redemption that we try to bring to people is being challenged by society and it's called, it's being categorized as doing something wrong. So, the truth we believe and the truth we practice according to the scriptures uh, in this case is being said to be wrong right now are we going to change no because we are the church is to be the pillar and a polar of truth and we saying this is the word of god we cannot change we will say homosexuality is a sin and we will continue to say that God can bring people out of this kind of a lifestyle set them free because it's there in scripture but we are faced with challenges how must we relate to people who oppose what we stand for oppose the truth that we stand for how do we minister to people in love without condemning them? So example, if a homosexual comes to church and he wants to attend church, what should we do? And if two people of the same sex want to get married, then they come to church and say, hey, we want to get married. Can you get us married? What should we do? And then there are other, you know, scenarios which um, they, they've been in the news and these were articles from last year. For instance, uh, if you're a business owner and uh, two people of same sex come come into the you know example, this this actually this actually happened, right? You know, uh, they're running they were running a bakery, and a gay couple came. They wanted to order their wedding cake. Uh, they're going to get married. And they all want to order, and the, and 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 the owner refused, saying, "See, I can't make a cake for you for your wedding because uh, this is a gay couple. You all get married; it's a same-sex marriage, and I don't believe that. I don't believe that. So I refused to make a cake. But then it became a legal issue, right? So does a business owner have the right to deny a service to somebody because of their sexual orientation and you know their stand on same-sex marriage um, or there are other scenarios where uh, like I said if you're the head of human resources or you know the chief culture officer in a in a organization and the organization has in policies that are inclusive and they say okay we want you know people of same you know basically homosexuals so also to 
be given equal opportunities and all these kinds of things. Uh, how, what would you do? You know, you're writing the policy, you're taking care of the human resources there. Well, how would you handle it? If you're a chief minister and you're a believer, I mean, you're in government, you're a believer, you're head of a state, uh, and there are people saying, you know, we want equal rights for homosexuals. We want equal rights for same-sex marriages. What would you do? How would you handle it? Or the local church? You know, like I said, if, if, if an homosexual wants to attend service, what would you do? <laughs> um, if they want to have marriages, what would you do? So I'm going to pause here and and I just would like to hear the thoughts of people in the class uh, on how would you respond to these kinds of situations? What are your thoughts? Um, just to discuss in class about this. And then we will get into uh, you know, a framework that I would like to present to us. So please feel free to share your thoughts. Okay, somebody's got to start. Pastor Kane. Go ahead, Sri Kumar. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, um, yeah, in that case, we sh as you said, um, we have to um, um, show the scripture and uh, the original, the that uh, you know, the original uh, divine plan of God uh, behind the marriage, like how why the God has created the marriage and. Uh, uh, what is the plan of God behind it? And uh, then we will make them understand by showing the truth. And um, as you said, we can only uh, win them uh, through through the love only, because without love, uh, we cannot we cannot uh, you know we cannot bring them out. Because this is the time where they are ignorant because of the the power of the darkness is blinded their mind, and uh, and only the love and the word of God can only bring them out. Uh, uh, bring them out from the darkness. So um, I think so. The approach of love and uh, with the with the power of the word, we have to counsel them. We have to pray over them. And um, if it like as you said, there is a, it's not a natural thing. It's a demonic influence. So we have to pray and uh, deliver them, make them understand the truth and um, the the original plan of God's uh, behind the marriage. Because many times people just understand that people just think that marriage means just uh, you know um, just uh, a male and a female or um, you know it's just um, something like a physical attraction. But uh, so many things we will just um, as uh, with the support of the word uh, we will counsel them and we will make them to understand the truth. And uh, um, I think so that is the only way which uh, through which we can able to win them. Thank you, Pastor. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, um, thank you, Shri Kumar. Let's uh, look at uh, these scenarios um, and I'll try to do this as quickly as possible. So if, uh, if a homosexual wants to attend your local church, okay, she wants to worship uh, um, and, uh, you know, if he comes there, what would be your reaction? How would you relate? What would, you know, and imagine you are the pastor. Yeah, right? So he wants to attend church. What, how would you handle it? Good morning, Pastor. Morning, Angie. How are you? I'm good, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Um, in, in our log church, we we have a young, a young, a young, a young man who is a, yeah, who is a homosexual, and he came into the church because of his mother, and he attends the church, and he he helps. He says he he, he finds he's there because he finds joy uh, in 
saving. So the only place that he is willing to to the the past allow him to 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 save it is the the coffee shop. So it's not there because he want he want to he knows Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus yet. Yet the the past allow him to to save in the in the, in the coffee area because he told the pastor that he by him being there he feels like he doesn't know what to do and so the pastor allow him to be there so that he can be influenced by other people and he allow him to to join other like youth meetings so that he can hear teachings and he can also participate in in prayer by that the pastor believed that god will work in his heart and through time he will come to understand the gospel because he's mm -hmm. confused he doesn't know what to do so he's there to seek help thank mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. yeah thank you for sharing that um i see um Tarun and christopher's uh, comments let him attend uh, beth has a question which i think we will come to right uh, after this. Um, Shrikumar, do you have a, something you wanted to say? Yeah, I just have a question, sir. Um, just want to know, like, um, many times people will not openly come and tell, tell the pastor that they are homosexual. So how we will able to identify because this is one of the things which most of the people want to hide them. And uh, every time we, are, we will never take a message saying about the homosexuality where they will understand. So mm -hmm. how uh, and uh, we are always pray, pray, speaking about grace and love and God's will. How a person can suddenly can able to tell the pastor that um, you know um, I am I am I'm a person like this. So in that case, how uh, like when we are not when we are unaware about that thing, mm -hmm. and um, uh, how we will approach such people? Sometimes that can be possible. Like when it is a big bigger crowd, like uh, you know. And pastor uh, maybe not able to um, um, interact with individuals many times. So in that case, how we can identify that truth? Thank you, pastor. That's just yeah. one question I just want to know. Thank you. That's a, that's a good point because obviously when you have many people attending, you won't know their private lives, personal lives, uh, unless they come and willingly share. And uh, you are right. <laughs> we are not addressing that issue, uh, you know, every time or every Sunday. You know, it may come up here and there, the reading of the scriptures. But uh, uh, so that's also a challenge. So, um, you know, I, 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 unless God Himself in some way exposes it or brings it to light, uh, we will not know. Um, it is very possible that people, you know, like any other kind of sin, they could. Uh, keep it under keep it secret nobody will know but you know as a shepherd as overseer we are praying we're expecting that god will address these things just by his presence by the preaching of the word uh, or bring it to light in some manner uh so th that's that's a good point and we just have to trust god to you know bring it to light uh, but if somebody does come and share or we get to know somebody who's like that then you know how should we relate to that person uh, we'll take uh, thoughts from nalini and also kennedy please go ahead ibrahim can it, nalini please mm. go ahead okay um let's see can I kennedy go ahead kennedy, kennedy go ahead mm, my question is just about uh, oh. some of us come from uh growing family they've been doing big business or uh alcohol promotion for a long time so is it ethical or is it proper for a believer to participate in an advert that promotes smoking or work in a beer manufacturing plant. What's your advice on that? Um, say that again, Kennedy. Uh, I, I just kind of heard the last part of what you said. Is it okay for believers to participate in advertisements 
that promote smoking and, and those kinds of things. Is, is that your question? Exactly. Yeah, yeah correct. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And what are they also inquiring? Is it, there are people who work for this beer manufacturing company. Those who work for beer manufacturing company, is it okay for a believer? Oh, oh, is it okay for a believer to work in a in a company that produces alcoholic beverages? Yeah, correct. Uh, correct. Yeah. So my my response is no, right? Uh, because we don't want to be part of that something that's actually destroying people's lives. So. Uh, you know, we don't want to be part of that, so we definitely look for a job somewhere else. Uh, we don't, we, we don't uh, get employed in um, a company that's creating products that uh, are destructive or against uh, our moral standards and values. We would not engage in that. Uh, uh, then there is this area where, for example, fashion design. You know, a believer involved in fashion design. You know, of course, yes, believers can be involved in that, but make sure your designs are some are in such a way that you know that honor God and uh, uh, you know. So we have to walk as believers walk the righteous path, even in that kind of a industry. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Mrs. Oliver. Uh, Pastor, sorry, I was speaking and I didn't realize I was on mute. Oh, okay. Uh, Pastor, this, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for this question, because on Tuesday, I'm going to have to speak to a 14-year-old girl who tells me that, uh, you know, homosexuals are, we are genetically wired. So while I have prepared biblical reasons for this, but I just want to know uh, this word, genetically wired, are they genetically wired? She gives examples of even, you know, transgender eunuchs. She says, right from childhood, from five years, there has been an inclination not to wear skirts, but to wear pants. Not to, you know, it's the other way around. So just a little clar uh, clarification on that, Pastor. Mm -hmm. All right. So we will uh, pick up, you know, the question I think is related to what Beth uh, has put earlier. So... There are a couple of things, uh, and, and you know, we, we can't always speak everything to a person. Uh, I'm just sharing this for us to understand. Uh, and then we need to always speak truth and love. So when you are speaking to the person, you know, uh, there there's some information you may not necessarily talk about because uh, it may not be, uh, it may, may be alarming, but let's look at it. So in, in the natural standpoint, there was a study put out by the an NIH uh, in the US, I think by Johns Hopkins, no, 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 not NIH, but Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and I, I don't have the link to study, but you can Google it, where uh, they, the paper that was put out basically said that the idea that uh, homosexual tendencies is linked to genetics is not true. Uh, so this being this was put out by Johns Hopkins University, so you can Google it. Um, so now, when people are saying, "Look, you know, these are genetic, I am genetically predisposed to this kind of behavior, these kind of tendencies," that's very questionable. Right? So that's one thing. S secondly, uh, could it be uh, like what uh, Beth has mentioned, life experiences and so on? Well. Um, it all depends on how we respond to life experiences. For example, if two people are abused as children, uh, it doesn't mean that every person who's abused as a child or goes through certain, you know, abusive experiences or harsh experiences in their childhood or all end up becoming homosexuals. That's not true. So again, we can say that, look, to come to this conclusion that just because you've been through a life experience, a certain kind of life experience that's abusive or so on, which has caused you to be become a homosexual or to be predisposed to this kind of a lifestyle, is not true because there are others who've gone through similar experiences who are not uh, given themselves over to, uh, are not predisposed to uh, a homosexual lifestyle. So to arrive at that conclusion again, will not be true. 
spiritually, what do we know? And this is something we don't go and tell people, but we have this understanding. One, we know that this is against God's design, first of all. Second, therefore, it is a deviation from God's design because of the fall. Third, many of this, these, these lifestyles can eventually be energized by unclean spirits. Right? So deliverance is involved. So we know this, but we can't go and tell them, look, this is what's happening, but we know it. So uh, uh, I think uh, the way we, uh, you know, just to wrap this up, uh, you know, our, our approach in, you know, uh, so if a homosexual comes to church or and they tell, told us, look, this is my life. So I think, first of all, we have to be loving to them. That is, we understand, just like any other sinner, you know, this like, uh, uh, you know, sin is sin, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's adultery, whether it's, um, you know, stealing or lying or uh, gossiping or, you know, uh, only in our minds we classify them, but ultimately sin is sin. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, um, uh, what we are saying, uh, okay, what I'm saying is, uh, just as we, you know, so what is our response? You know, we must be loving, uh, welcome them, but be, but work with them through love, through you know, in, in a loving way, not in a forceful way, not in a condemning way, um, work with them uh, if they are willing to receive, to, uh, you know, to see them transformed by the power of God and in the name of Jesus. So love them and help them on this journey. But not everybody is willing to go on this journey. In fact, today there's a big backlash against the church for trying, even trying to help people make this journey. There's a big backlash or criticism of the church and even attempting to engage with people on this transformative journey. They're, they're against it. So, you know, but we still have to do it lovingly for those who are willing to go on it. But if people are not willing, at some point we have to take a step because one, uh, you know, we need to tell them, look, if you want to be part of this community, this is the standard by which we live, right? So while we will accommodate, but there is a line. You know, you cannot continue in sin and expect to be part of God's community. You know, so that, that, that line has to be drawn somewhere. Otherwise, what will happen is they could actually bring that influence into the church and more people could go down that path. So we also, as a pastor, we have to be careful about that. Okay. Okay, Pastor, one more to add to this. Then there was another child who put up uh, Romans 1, 24, and he says, then God gave them up to their uh, uncleanness or, you know, something it states like that. Mm -hmm. So she says, it is God who made us like this. So they are quoting that scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we have to do is, okay, let's read the whole passage. Let's re read the verses before and let's read the verses after all the way into chapter two. So when it says God gave them up, it, it, it's that statement, God gave them up, I think is mentioned at least three times in that passage. God yes. gave them up to their wild passions. God gave yes. them up to their corrupt, depraved mind. Yes. Uh, God gave them up. You know, So it doesn't mean God is approving of it. It just means God has let them go into their wrong things. Ultimately, the passage ends by saying all of these who do such things will end up in the wrath of God. Right. So okay, just we just have to get them to read the verses before and after and see, okay, what's the conclusion of the matter? The matter is God let people go in these things, but they all ended up under the wrath of God. Chapter two. I put it down as like it is your choice. When I mean, I've written down notes for them. Like it's your choice. Like God gave them that choice. Is that the right way to tell them? Yes. It is the choice that you have. Uh, God is allowing them, allowing you to make. That's correct. It's okay. a choice. You know, God's. That's what God's doing. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right. So. Can I, can I ask can, one more, please, Pastor? Go ahead, Kennedy. Uh, what I wanted just to inquire is the issue of blood transfusion. Because I've seen cases where some pastors advise their congregants not to donate blood. 
what's your advice on that? Yeah, uh, my my right, perspective. That maybe something to maybe something to do with participating in these things that are genetically modified. I feel like food stuff that are genetically modified blood transfusion. Mm. So we will come to we will come to genetics. Uh, I put down that as a separate point uh, in in this in this chapter. We will come to it. Blood transfusion. I think there's there's nothing really wrong. Uh, I'm I'm just speaking in general terms. I mean, of course, if you want to give chapter and verse, we can quote you know. Uh, the scripture from Acts, where it says, "God has made from one blood all the nations," but that's that's it's not medically. <laughs> uh, it's just okay. But what I'm saying is, uh, what I want to say is that uh, you know, donating blood, blood transfusion, medically it's safe, right? You know, we know that individuals have certain. Um, there are these four, I think, four blood types. And then they, of course, they transfuse. They give the person the same blood type as uh, the donor's blood should match the uh, recipient's blood. And it saves life because, you know, um, that's needed. So, uh, I, 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 and blood transfusion is not genetically modifying the person. It's not effective. It's just saving the life of the person or helping the life of the person. So, uh, medically, it's safe. Uh, therefore, there's nothing wrong in doing that. Um, the Bible specifically, of course, doesn't speak to that particular scenario of blood transfusion. So therefore, whenever the Bible is silent, God wants us to arrive at a conclusion based on what is revealed and based on our best understanding. So on both, both sides, blood transfusion is not harmful. It's not, uh, I don't see it as something uh, against God. Okay. Uh, going back to what we are talking about, this whole thing about homosexuality and same-sex marriage, I'll just, you know, um, you know, I, I thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, yeah, and uh, what I want to just present to us is, you know, we uh, need to have some sort of a framework. Uh, by which we, you know, arrive at decisions, especially, you know, in these kinds of matters, right? And the best way to do, arrive at this framework is look at God. How does God deal with us as sinners, right? Here are some of the things that we can uh, conclude. One is God does not override human will, okay? So... You know, if people make a choice, just like we mentioned a little earlier, as uh, Mrs. Oliver was mentioning, you know, if people make a choice, he doesn't, you know, hit them on the head and say, why are you making a wrong choice? No, he doesn't override human will. He, he's lets, he lets people go uh, uh, according to their choice, right? But what does God do? He expresses or he tells us what is right and wrong. And then it invites us to choose what is right. right. So he sets before us life and death. And he says, choose life. So he says, look, this is right. This is wrong. I want you to choose what's right. So that's how God works. So when we deal with people, that's part of our framework. God is also willing to reason with us. He says, okay, let's sit down. Let's discuss. Let's reason. Right. So... We should be willing to reason with people, listen to what they have to say, and then we provide our answers. God treats everybody with love and fairness. He makes the sun to shine on the good and the bad. He gives rain to the good and the bad. So we must treat everybody equally with love and fairness. But God does not compromise himself. He is truth, holy, just loving. He doesn't compromise himself in his dealing with the sinner, right? He doesn't say, okay, sinner, I love you so much, so I'll just overlook your sin. No. He loves the sinner, but he also addresses the sin. So I want to just present this as a little framework for us in, in, in how we think, right? That is, let's not try to override their choice. I mean, we can't force on them truth. We can't force truth on people. 
and you cannot force truth on people even through legislation. It's only think about it. I mean, it's good to have laws that are aligned to the word of God. But uh, remember, you can't legislate morality. You can't legislate truth into human will. Because ultimately, people are going to do what they want to do. We can have all the laws, but people are going to do what they want to do. Right? So keep that thought in mind. You cannot override human will with truth. But we can definitely express what's right and wrong and encourage people to choose what's right. We can reason with them. We, can, we must treat people with love and fairness even if they don't agree with us. That's how God is, right? He makes the rain to fall even on the sinner. But we don't compromise ourselves. We don't compromise our truth, our position on the truth. We know what the Bible says. Personally, we will live by it. Personally, we'll pursue it. So that means we will pray, we will intercede. Uh, where people are willing to receive, we will minister healing, we will minister deliverance and wholeness, help them journey into the truth without compromising ourselves. So keep this in mind. Um, and we need to keep this in mind in the decisions we make. right? So for example, if you go back to the scenario where a person comes to church, he says, I'm a homosexual. He tells you, well, we're not going to immediately force him to stop, but we're going to explain to him the word of God. We're going to be willing to listen and reason with him. We're going to treat him with love and fairness. But then there's a point where we say, look, this is where things, this is the line that we draw. Uh, you know, we can't, you, we, we, we will not compromise truth just to accommodate him. God doesn't do that. God says, let the wicked forsake his way. So we will have to say, look at it. And there comes a time when you will have to make a choice. And beyond this, we will not be able to accommodate you because this is where truth and love intersect. And if you cross this line, you have to embrace truth. And, uh, you know, um, we cannot compromise truth for the sake of love. God doesn't do that. He is truth and love, and he doesn't compromise either part of himself. So, you know, that's that's something that God has to give us wisdom in, and learn as you work with individuals, and uh, and and work with them. Okay. Uh, let's pause here. We've reached our break time, um, and uh, yeah. So let's come back after after our break. Uh, we'll continue with this. Uh, discussion. Okay. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> 